Hello. Hi. 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 Hello. I'm curious about. I'm curious about. I'm curious I'm about. Curious about. I'm curious about building open, authentic, loving relationship. I'm curious about jealousy. I'm curious about polyamory. Does it just mean that you're fucking all the time? How can I tell my parents that my partner is already married? I'm curious about... How do you know when you're too busy to have another relationship? I'm curious about dominant and subordinate relationship. I'm curious about sexual health. How can relationships, How can relationships evolve, evolve with people evolve as they grow and change? Grow and change? Welcome to the Curious Fox podcast. For those challenging the status quo in love sex and relationships. My name's Effie Blue. And I'm Jacqueline Misla. And today we're challenging the idea that the only path to healing and regaining a sense of calm is through our minds. In a modern world where we focus on our brains for productivity and personal growth, we're curious about the role that our bodies or the soma play in helping us self-regulate when we're triggered or in the midst of relationship conflict. Our guide through this conversation is Rida Kurusha. Rida is a sound healing therapist, meditation facilitator, and somatic experience practitioner. A graduate of the British Academy of Sound Therapy, Rida follows a multidimensional discipline that comprises sound healing, meditation, free movement experience, and somatic exploration on the groundwork of nervous system regulation. Rida published six sound healing and meditation albums so far, all of which are available online. She creates spaces where we can tap into our body's magical healing capabilities and expand our toolbox for self-healing, managing stress, and self-regulating the nervous system. I've been working with people in sessions for around five years now, and after digging deeper into the core of their struggles, I keep coming down to the same place, a sense of safety or their lack of. In my personal journey of self-exploration and healing, I arrive at the same place myself. How can I cultivate a sense of safety within? I have eight years of talk therapy under my belt and a pretty in-depth understanding of an array of talk therapy modalities, which I use in my practice. However, over the last couple of years, I've come to realize I've hit the limits of what talk therapy can achieve. There is a massive somatic component to therapy, especially if you're trying to heal trauma, especially developmental or childhood trauma. The search for these other modalities of healing led me to movement first. You've heard me talk about five rhythms a bunch of times. And recently, sound therapy, which led me to the brilliant and wise Rida. We dig into this and a lot more with Rida and end the discussion with a short guided meditation. We hope that you enjoy the interview. Good to have you, Rida. So nice to have you on the podcast. Oh, Welcome. Yeah. Welcome. We have known each other for a little bit now. Um, I've come to some of your retreats. And yeah. what I love about your work is how you really focus on the body and the somatic experiencing and sound healing to really help with regulating the nervous system, healing trauma, and really being connected to, with our bodies. And I think that work is really, really important. All that to me leads into this idea of sense of safety in the body. Yeah, I totally agree that because my whole uh, journey started with me and my anxieties, which brought me to the point that I thought I, w- I was trying to make my world a safe place, but I didn't know how to. And that led me to meditation that led me to sound healing. And then it led me to somatic experiencing. So, yes, I, I yes. agree. Yes. What you've just said immediately resonated with me, which is that you were trying to make your world safe. And I think what we realize now is that actually safety or sense of safety comes from within, right? Exactly. The effort is to try to control the world to make us feel safe. But I think it really starts with a sense of safety that is generated from within. Is it, like As soon as you said that, I was like, that is, that is the thing, right? Exactly. And that actually was very striking for me because I realized that I was trying to make the world safe. And then, of course, I couldn't do that because it's not my, uh, <laughs> under my control, which created more anxiety. So the, it was like a paradox. I was trying to calm my anxiety by controlling outside and it didn't just work. So I had to go to, an, to the other direction by feeling safe within or, and also containing my own emotions and 
and trying to regulate myself, basically. And that's such a challenging moment that you've just described. I've experienced it. And there's a, someone who I love in my family who is in the midst of anxiety now. Mm-hmm. And we are experiencing it with them where they both feel tremendous sense of fear and anxiety and understand that nothing is triggering that, yeah. that nothing in their external environment is creating that. And yet they feel that deeply and yeah. it is challenging. Certainly I've been in that position, but also watching someone that you love and you want to say, everything is okay. Everything's yeah. okay. We're going to be okay. And they can't feel that, but yeah. in their minds, they also know that is true. Yeah. And that is so difficult to yeah. like be of those two minds. Yeah. And I remember having my best friends telling me maybe 10,000 times and I asked them to, please, can you tell me that everything is okay and everything's going to pass? But then after all those years, I realized that I was not able to embody that information. So hearing that when the body doesn't hear it, it doesn't go to the nervous system. Let's, yeah. let's put it in a very easy way. And, mm-hmm. and that I was not just convinced. After two minutes, my body was sending my brain these uh, sense of signals that I was not safe. So I just had to repeat it over and over again. And then I realized that uh, I had to change how I feel in the body. So I totally understand that talking at those mm-hmm. moments, especially in anxiety, it's, mm-hmm. it really doesn't work. Yes. It didn't work for me though. Yes. And you see this in relationships too, right? You'll, you'll get a partner that, that is asking like, tell me it's okay. Tell me you're not going to leave me. Tell me, you know, we're going to be okay. Tell me you love mm. me. Reassure me, reassure me. And we know that it might work for those a couple of minutes, it might just like be effective five minutes, but immediately it dissipates and the need to get reassured again pops back again. And I think it's the same loop, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I remember once I was having a conversation with Effie and it was in the midst of a relationship challenge and I was emotional and, and I was feeling anxious and she was saying, you really, you, there's some tension in your body that you need to work out. And I was like, yes, that's true. I'm going to read an article. You're right. I'm going to talk to somebody. I'm going to, and Effie said, you cannot solve a body problem with a brain solution. <laughs> And that was like, fair, (laughs) fair, fair. And so that's what it sounds like we're saying is that even if your mind understands, if if that is held in your body, your body will be sending your mind messages saying, don't listen to anything else. (laughs) I am telling you that we are under attack. Yeah. 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 So let's start from the beginning with that. I'd love for um, you to tell us what happens in the nervous system when we feel safe or unsafe. Like what, what is actually happening in our, in our physical body when we're feeling safe versus unsafe? So if uh, we are uh, somewhere and then we see a lion, for example, who might kind of hunt us, right? The first thing that happens in our body is that uh, is the the sympathetic arousal that is called, and then the body tries to protect us to keep us alive, and then it secretes some hormones called cortisol, adrenaline, and all that. And actually, what happens in the body and in the nervous system is that we get into fight, flight, or freeze, and that is very good that to keep us alive. The thing that we need to complete in the nervous system um, sense is that when we get that aroused, we need to also uh, go back to the parasympathetic nervous system, which is called uh, the resilience of our nervous system. So it needs to go down and cool down and, and release all that tension that was in the body. This is very good thing that we do if we have time. Time is very important here, but usually under attacks or like car accidents or like in a relationship when we hear something and we are in in the party, for example, we don't have time to digest all that. It sticks within our nervous system. And if we don't have time, if we don't open a space for that, the body cannot just release Uh, all that energy out. And this is what Peter Levine uh, found somatic experiencing uh, with because he um, studied the nervous system of animals and he realized that even though they were faced against life-threatening situations more than we do, they don't show any post-traumatic stress symptoms. 
-hmm. And then he realized that because um, they were resolving all that by shaking, by trembling. And we don't do that because life is very fast. We don't have time for that. We don't know how to, because mm -hmm. all we were thought is to be clever. I mean, in the mind, uh, solving things with the mind as if the body is not that important. And it's just a place of being beautiful or functioning or whatever. Not that it has an intelligence itself, And yet it has an amazing intelligence and we can learn from it. So what happens in the nervous system is when we face a threat, the nervous system try to keep us alive. And the, the moment of, oh, that's over, realizing it, sensing it. I'm not just saying realizing from the mind, but sensing that, ah, oh, that's mm -hmm. now I'm safe. Mm -hmm. Then the cycle is complete and we are more open to engage in life. Otherwise our all energy goes to the resistance we have inside and we just don't have the energy to engage, uh, outside and with life and with the, with relationships. And Stephen Porges, who found the polyvagal theory said that it's very interesting that when we spend all our energy in fight or flight, we don't have energy to engage with other people. So relationships If we know how to regulate ourselves, we can have more um, easy, we can do more easy in relationships. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are two things that you said that really just struck me. One is, I think, so I've always understood and or known we can hold things in our body. Mm -hmm. the way that you've just described it to say there is this rush of adrenaline that happens. There are all these chemicals and there is not a wind down. Those chemicals just stay there. They're, they become, they get stuck somewhere inside of your body. That actually connects to me more than I've understood it before. I think I understood it in like a woo-woo way. Like we hold oh, yeah. on to things. What I hear you saying is, no, no, actually <laughs> there are things that happen in your body. And if you don't go to, through a cycle of releasing them, they get trapped in your body yeah. and that toxic there's something there that will continue to, to impact how yes. you show up in your physical body. So I appreciate that explanation because I think I'm, I'm seeing that really differently. I think the other thing that, that stands out to me is you mentioned that we, our culture does not necessarily allow for us to go through that process. And yeah. often when you are feeling fear and anxiety, particularly if people around you are saying, it's okay, it's okay, mm. you are disguising the fact that you yeah. are feeling that level of stress. So not only are you not going through the cycle, you are actually putting more stress and anxiety mm -hmm. on yourself by trying to pretend that you are not in any stress or anxiety. <laughs> and so yeah. you may look calm, but you're actually creating more internal damage yeah. by not mm -hmm. feeling the thing and going through the cycle of feeling the thing. Exactly. And people who have gone through or still is uh, through anxiety knows that having anxiety of having an anxiety becomes more of a problem when you have anxiety because yes. you're anxious of getting anxious. And yes. that is a loop. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And, and in anticipation of anxiety is anxiety, right? Oh, I'm going to get anxious. We'll set off your anxiety. It's this horrible, vicious loop of kind of peaking and staying at that peak um, yeah. and not being able to come down from it. And I think over time, this is my understanding of it. Your nervous system kind of gets used to that high, right? Yes, exactly. And, and the body adapts to that because if you think that you're constantly under stress, your muscles listen to it. And then at some point your neck muscles or here could tense because what happens with us is what, if we see a line, our body gets tense, right? Because it, it prepares itself to fight or flight. And then if you don't realize that the threat is over and you, then the muscles keep uh, tense. So yes, it's very important to, and in somatic experiencing in, in private sessions, we really work on the moments that it passed because usually, for example, an earthquake, we know that it, it's over and it passed. But if we, I'm not saying realizing it with the mind, but realizing it with the body, giving time to body to really understand, oh, that's over. And then it comes uh, the next emotions that were suppressed, so to say, when, when, when realizing that it's over. And I found when I was training, 
I thought like, what? Of course I know when an earthquake is over, right? So like, what are you really talking about? But then I saw in my private sessions, when I, I was taking sessions, I realized that sometimes uh, a small procedure, like a dental, I didn't really realize that my, my kind of my chin didn't realize that it was over. It was too fast. It, it, it happened, but I didn't really sense that, oh, it's finished. I'm not there anymore. And it's very interesting because it's also in the shamanic practices that they're talking about the same thing. And I'm very surprised that somatic experiencing was mentioning this a lot. So, uh, this is very important. I think that we're, what we're talking now. So I think that's fascinating to me. And I, and I totally agree with you that your mind and your I can speak for myself and I think Jackie and I share this as well, that we, we can be disembodied people. We live in our heads. Uh, we're thinkers and we're good at thinking. So we do the thing that we're good at, right? We, we think and, and sometimes we overdo it. We overthink and we try to problem solve through more thinking. You know, the problems that are caused by our thinking, we try to problem solve by thinking more <laughs> and getting more and more disconnected from our bodies. So intellectually, I understand what you're saying, which is your mind might be like, yep, this is over. I'm out the other side, but my, your body is not, hasn't got the memo, right? I'm curious, what are some of the way, like that idea really resonates with me. Like I know my body does that. I'm curious to what are some of the ways that people can notice that's what they're doing, right? I mean, we've done so much work on this. So I know this is how my body works. What are some of the ways that our listeners can be like, oh, like that's what happens to me as well. Like, what are the signs that they might not be allowing their body to catch up with their, with their thoughts? Thinking really fast and not hearing the body needs is a perfect example that we are not uh, really listening to the body's messages. Even small things, and I think they're very big things though, and they, they sound small, but like feeling hunger, feeling fullness, feeling cold, feeling warm. These are very important things that we usually don't give uh, attendance to. And they're very important actually. And, or feeling the ground. Sometimes it takes five, six sessions with someone to just feel the chair they're sitting in. They know that they're sitting in the chair, but the body do doesn't really let itself feeling the support of the chair because it just doesn't trust anything. The, the mind doesn't trust the chair and say, oh, this is something that really supports me so I can let go. I can, I can uh, relax a little bit. It doesn't say that. So the body doesn't let. So listening to the body, listening to how tense I am, listening to, oh, this is a nice moment and I'm relaxing. How do I sense that in the body? Because I realize after all this work, uh, words like we do, we are talking now is a uh, very good vehicles of communication and the mind, whereas the body's vehicle is, is sensations. So if I say I'm safe, but I don't feel it, I don't sense safety in the body, then it's not connected. So what I can suggest is, oh, I'm very happy. This moment is very beautiful. How do I sense that in the body? Asking that and, and giving some time to feel that in the body. If I really, I can really take it in would be a great uh, meditation, a great communication that we can work on. That's what I think. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I think for me, I can feel that I have, I'm still holding on, even if my brain thinks I've let it go. When I realize that I have stopped breathing, <laughs> when I like realize that I'm like, hold, have been holding my breath this whole time, or my chin, as you mentioned, my jaw is still clenched and tight, or my shoulders are up, or my partner will reach out to, you know, to touch me and my body like flinches and pulls away. Like I, I'm not aware of my tightness and my rigidity until I become aware of it. Mm -hmm. Until at some point I like gasp for air <laughs> and realize, or my shoulders are in pain and I realize that they're up in the air where I realize like, oh, I'm still, I thought that I was fine. I've moved on yeah. in my mind, but my body has not moved on. Yeah. Yes. Totally. I think um, the pieces about what you just said about like not feeling cold, not feeling hot, not feeling mm. hunger. I can, mm. you know, I, I, I definitely don't feel my hunger until suddenly I'm absolutely famished and I can like eat my own arm. <laughs> it's because mm. I like I haven't been eating for the entire day. Yeah. Or um, I hold my pee. 
Like that's yeah. a, that's a that's something that I'm trying so hard not to do. I'll be like at, by the time I'm peeing, I could just be bursting. Yes. You yeah. know, and and um God forbid, it's like someone's in the bathroom. I'm like banging on the wall. <laughs> no, you have to get out now. You know, it's because I've just, I'm so, I can get to a place where I'm, if I'm not careful, so disconnected yeah. from my body that I'm not aware of my bodily functions. And I think, yeah. right, you're just like even realizing that is a good place to start. Yeah. Exactly. I have a question for you. So in the example that you gave, there's a lion chasing us and, and we get away from the lion and we're like, we're safe now. Yeah. That feels like a, a real threat. We are experiencing something that is endangering our life. We see when it's there. We see when it's gone. Yeah. In relationship, it is harder to see the actual threat or to know if it's real threat versus perceived danger. Yeah. And so I'm wondering then if it is perceived danger in our minds, mm -hmm. number one, how, how can we you know, distinguish that for ourselves? But number two, when do you know it's over? <laughs> when do you know that the metaphorical lion has left and that we're now safe? Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I want to ask that question because I'm interested in exactly that. What's real, what's perceived and what's physical versus emotional danger. Like a lion mm. is very much a physical danger. Like it's mm, going to come yeah. and eat me. I think these days, not many of us get to deal with lions, right? Which is a good yeah. thing. Um, so I'm really interested in the difference between, like Jackie said, the real danger, perceived danger, physical danger and emotional yeah. danger. Like do, are they, how are they different in all of this? Are they at all actually? Well, if your body feels that it's under danger, that is a danger. If it gives a reaction of a danger, then you perceive it as a danger. And what we talk about anxiety is the, the person feels anxious or gets panicked and that is a danger. And for someone else, it's not a danger. And that's why talking about it, it's not important because that person feels the danger. So the perceived threat here is the body feeling that it is under danger. So a perceived threat means there is no real danger of, of a life-threatening situation. But for example, our, my partner doesn't answer the phone and then I get an anxiety attack. That is a perceived threat because I feel like, oh my God, something bad is going to happen and I, I cannot regulate that. And then I make up um, scenarios in my mind. So I keep that. So why do mindfulness practices and somatic experiencing, it helps us to get aware and, and the body, listening to the body, it actually is uh, working also on our awareness that we realize, oh, that is a phone that's not being answered and it's not a lion who is going to haunt me in 10 seconds. So even differentiating that and letting the body feel that kind of changes how the nervous system uh, thinks or feels or how the body feels. And therefore, it's very important to, to know how the body reactions are and then how to know. It's very important to be aware of what is happening in my body now. Do I feel something as a perceived threat? How do I know that if I'm holding my breath, if my, if the heart starts to pump faster? So if I give reactions of a perceived threat, that means there's something triggering and there is bringing awareness to that would really help. And the perceived threat means therefore emotional threat could be an answered phone for the other one. It could be abandonment. Or, I mean, it could be all that. So there is no real explanation for what a threat is, but what a person perceives as a threat is a threat. And maybe it could be worked on. So how do I react to kind of threats in my life? Because if I have issues with my, I mean, 90% is that, right? In relationships, we bring our baggage to the relationship and then we kind of, uh, the relationship is a great mirror to us to see ourselves. So if we have an issue that has been unresolved, we probably will carry it to our relationship because we carry it in our nervous system. So it's, we cannot ex escape from it because we have it with us, within us. You know, it's, it's interesting that also that you use that example, because that happened to me a few days ago where I was trying to get in touch with my wife 
and she didn't pick up the phone. And that's not uncommon. Like we will go away for hours at a time, be out of reach because we're working or something, but she had an appointment and the person who she had appointment with reached out to me and said, I'm reaching out to her and I can't get in touch. So I reached out to her. I couldn't get in touch. And within a matter of five minutes, I went from, Hey, can you give me a call to, are you there to I'm on my way home? And like had, had like, like escalated to panic like flying to the train station to go, to go. She calls me and is like, no, no, I'm here. I'm here. I just had my phone down. And first, first, of course, I'm, I'm, I feel relieved. Then I feel furious. And then I just start weeping. Like it like hit me and she's like, it's okay. Like I've been gone for longer than this. It's, you know, I'm okay. It's okay. And I'm like, no, no, you're right. You're right. And so I, I like pull myself together, stop crying. But I realize that in the coming days, a commercial will come up and I'll start crying or someone yeah. will tell me something and I'll start crying. And I, and I was thinking to myself, like I checked my app. I wasn't, I wasn't going to get my period. Like yeah. that wasn't it. <laughs> right. I like check all the things. I'm like, why am I crying so much? As you're saying this, I'm, I think to myself, oh, I stopped myself mm-hmm. from fully letting go and it held in my body. Yeah. And so any opportunity that my body got to try to release it, it was trying to release it because yeah. I had not just said, Oh, there's the fear. There's the relief. Like, let's let it all out. And I was holding on to it all week. Yeah. Amazing what you just said. A great example. Thank you. These kind of panics as well, especially within the relationship. What I what I notice from working with people is that more often than not, it'll boil down to a fear of abandonment, which I think on a nervous system level, honestly feels like death. Right. Because we know that, you know, at a very young age, when we're when we're born, love, safety, love and safety are connected to one another. Right. Because our parents keep us safe because they because they love us. It's it's not the love that, you know, we talk about of chocolates and and roses, but that evolutionary love that really keeps us connected to one another. And I think when we're in a, uh, an adult relationship, when that that fear of abandonment gets gets triggered, it really feels like actual death. So some of those like emotional um, threats or, or things that the uh, emotional dangers really do feel like almost like physical like a lines about the attack me right. Yeah, exactly, and that's the point. Because um, yes, the uh, the the attachment and the early childhood is kind of like the basis of our nervous system. And therefore, in somatic experiencing or in other other therapeutic tools, uh, it's very important to work on that early childhood times because when something is not completed there, and of course we were kids and we didn't know how to complete a cycle, we need the other to regulate us. We need the other to contain us. We need other to say, "Oh, it's gone. It's it's over. We're, you're safe." Our nervous system gets trained how to self-regulate and how to feel, come back to, to, to yourself. And if we didn't have that chance, we have to t- learn it when we are older, but um, still we can get triggered when we face a threat like that. And th- that kind of big bursts are usually could be signs of very, er- very early times that our nervous system didn't have time to release. In somatic experiencing, then we how uh, we don't assume, but usually it's always a good thing to ask: Is this the is this the first time I'm f- sensing this? Because usually the answer is no. Because the body remembers in our mind, we does we don't remember, but the b- body remembers. And when we say, "Do I remember the first time I f- I felt this?" Maybe it was in the elementary school where our teacher didn't answer our question. It might sound very little for uh, for us uh, grown ups, but for that nervous system, it was a big deal. And it, it was triggering the abandonment. So maybe we can then find, oh, this is actually connected. It might be connected to that time. And then working on, on that uh, time to release what was incomplete and get it out the system, sort to say, to open new place. Yeah, that's uh, it's like I, I know this stuff. I work in this stuff personally. 
And with clients, yet it continues to fascinate me how the, our early childhood experiences just stick around and, and become the blueprint of, of the way that we live our lives here. And if we don't go back and, and like you said, complete some of these circles or really address that stuff, it affects everything from our sense of well-being all the way to the integrity and the, the integrity of our relationships and the joy that we feel in the world. So it's, it's so, so, so important. So what can we do? What, what are some of the things that we can do as adults that can promote an inner sense of safety? That's not something that we're asking for other people to help us regulate us or, or looking to control our environment so we feel safe. But how, how do we promote that inner sense of safety? I think it starts with how do I feel safe in the body? Because everyone has a different way of sensing safety. Some feel safe. In, in the sessions, for example, when they have a pillow behind their back and then th that brings this sense of safety while some other people feel uh, when they wrap themselves in a blanket and they feel contained, that brings this a safety. I think the starting point here is what things help me feel safe? For example, if it's being together with a, with a loved one and having them listen to me, how do I sense that in the body? It's like feeding the nervous system by using the sensations. So actually a good start is what safe means to me? How, the, how would that feel? Is there any part in my body that feels safe at the moment? Maybe the tip of my nose feels safe. So how does that feel in the body now? When I say my tip of my nose feels safe. So feeling that, let it sink in the nervous system, sort to say, by sensing it, it helps us to develop a sense of safety. And then if we do that, then we can know when we start to feel unsafe. I realized years after that uh, traffic sounds and the, the city sounds made me anxious. I didn't really realize that for a long, long time. I thought it was exciting me. And then I learned the difference between excitement and anxiety. I realized that I was actually very confusing them both. I thought anxious things were exciting and exciting things could make me anxious. And I just didn't really understand why bir my birthdays were always a mess because it was exciting me. And then I couldn't contain that excitement and it turned to anxiety and being heartbroken at the end, of course, because I couldn't really contain that emotion. So if we know how to, how we are feeling safe, in the body, then we can realize where we are feeling unsafe. And then we can start to help us regulate ourselves. Like, oh, I can feel my jaw tensing. I can feel my shoulders tensing. And I know if I don't do anything at some point, my body will start to react. So maybe realizing that I'm wondering if you can if you can talk more about distinguishing between anxiety and anxiousness. That feels there's two things that come to my mind immediately. One is my daughter has lots of anxiety and and she knows like if she gets too excited, like joyful, she will actually have to know to temper down her her excitement because yeah. it could lead to her feeling anxious if she is too excited. Yeah. And I'm thinking about folks who are in relationships that from the from the outside look real toxic and chaotic but yeah. inside of it they think it's a whirlwind of excitement and energy <laughs> and so how does one how did you go through the process for yourself of distinguishing between i am anxious and i am excited and these and, and how yeah. they led to another yeah i realized when i was sensing uh, excitement in the body i just realized when i was staying with it i just realized it started to turn into an anxiety in my stomach and i was like what is going on here and i was in my somatic experiencing session so i uh, my practitioner said slow down here and let's just stay, go a little bit back and, and sense the excitement. And then I realized the point where it turned, my body was mixing because it didn't know how to distinguish between that. And I really, so I love somatic experiencing because it's a very beautiful way of, of training the nervous system and the body and, and uncoupling the overcoupled concepts and ideas. And then I really started to feel 
what is excitement, regulating myself before getting, as I said, the arousal comes and then it has to go down. I just didn't know. It was just going up, 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 up. I, I couldn't know where to stop because it was, it, it is a story of my childhood. So I didn't know how to regulate myself. So the anxiety is a sympathetic arousal sort to say, which is nice because that's what we get aroused in, in while we're having sex. So it's like, it's the same that it goes up the nervous system. It excites it. And if the nervous system think, uh, doesn't know how to regulate or, or confuses it with anxiety, even a, a, a beautiful wanted sexual intercourse can turn into an anxiety as well. It's the same because it's the nervous system has to distinguish, distinguish them. And how do we do that? By sensing it. And I sensed in a session that, Oh, excitement. I can stay with that. I, I contained it. And then I worked on the anxiety and then it's, it's magical because once I pointed that out in real life, I started to see, Oh, this is actually getting anxious. Like putting uh, three different meetings in a row. It's exciting, but actually no, it's not exciting anymore. I realized <laughs> that it's actually getting me anxious. It gives me a false sense of, yeah, you did good today. You mm-hmm. accomplished, but actually it was getting me anxious. Mm, that's interesting. Absolutely. I think that's such an important distinction. I think this maps onto relationships that have periodic drama. When people seek drama in relationships, if they haven't figured out what's going on with them on a nervous system level, if they haven't, if they're not attuned maybe within the relationship with the, with one another, that in an effort to seek excitement, that that they cause drama, that it is it is it is a way to kind of feel alive in the relationship, rather than it, rather than doing it through connection, um, rather than doing it through um, like healthy, you know, um, sex. Yeah. If you're not getting those, you kind of just like cause drama, cause act, cause arguments, provoke the other person, lose your own temper. And that, that excitement, that arousal on some level is perceived that, you know, this relationship is still alive. Can I ask for, so what does this look like in a practical example? So I imagine, so imagine someone is in the midst of conflict with a parent, with a partner, with their child, and they can feel themselves getting, right? Their energy coming up, they're aroused, they're, they're excited, they're, they move to anxiety. And, and actually what you said earlier stuck with me as well, where I am feeling a sense of threat. And so I am showing up that way, but the person who I'm arguing with may not be feeling that sense of threat. So they're looking at me like, what is wrong with you? Yeah. Right. I have been on the other side of that look many a time of the calm down. I'm not sure what's <laughs> happening here, but this, you need to relax. And then first it actually makes me even more anxious and furious, right? Mm-hmm. Because I feel like I no, I'm not crazy. I am feeling this thing and your face and your words are telling me I am, I shouldn't be feeling it, but I am. So it gets bigger and their eyes get bigger. <laughs> and so I'm wondering kind of in that moment when you find yourself in that situation of, of being, feeling threatened and reacting from that place, how do you a uh, regulate your nervous system? And then the second piece is then how do you acknowledge the threat is over and what's a ritual or, you know, to like, let that go to release that. Yeah. I, um, it's amazing thing to have a self-regulation toolbox. Yes. And I think that is something that yes. I think that should be thought in, in elementary school, right? Yes, yes. please. Yes. 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 <laughs> it's something we have, we had to, we have to learn because this is the basis of everything. And yet, I mean, yeah, we t- tend to get regulated with other stuff that is sometimes not healthy, but actually we need to learn that. And, and when you say that, when we get, when we realize that we, we are getting tense, it's a very good thing to know your resources and the toolbox of regulation. And it, it might change for every, everyone else. But for me, I, I really, and it, I might look very uh, stupid and crazy from outside, but I really take time to feel the, the earth and then I look around to see, okay, is that, does there, is there anything that looks calm and good around here? Mm-hmm. And then I connect with it because I, I know that I perceive that person as a lion and I just lock my 
whole thing and I want to win that conversation, mm-hmm. you know, I want to, I want to be the right one. And just zooming out of that, coming back to my body, it, it is in my toolbox. The other thing that also Peter Levine's a lot talks about is self-touch because we kind of, when we get into the flight or fight mode, mm-hmm. we, we don't, sense the whole body and we don't, we are not relaxed. So I usually use self-touch, but especially touching the jaw, touching the neck, touching the body and feeling that, Oh, I'm here. I'm okay. And I'm touching. And that usually calms me down. And then it comes a deep breath. And we see it in somatic sessions that it, it, we don't force it, but it comes when we start to downregulate, when we start to calm down, that breath comes and then we can slow it down. And usually after we have the fight, after we discharge by like yelling or, or I don't know, then we have a sense of calmness. Like, why did I do that? Like yes. <laughs> what just happened? Mm-hmm sounds crazy because Mm -hmm. after we release all that, it sounds crazy. It looks crazy. Mm -hmm. And so having a self-regulation toolbox is, I think is very important. And what, what I have been giving examples could not work for everyone because everyone is a different person and they have a different regulation system. Some of uh, my clients, they do breath, they hold their breath and then they, uh, let it out for a longer time, which actually imitating the parasympathetic nervous system state where we are more relaxed, we actually get exhale longer. So they do it a couple of times and they say it works uh, great. I don't use that, but I, I'm more of a body person. So I touch my body and sometimes go wash with a cold water we know all this actually, but we just don't remember to do it because we are not aware that we are actually getting triggered. That's the point. We know how to regulate ourselves. We, ha- we all have some ways, but we just don't know it until we lose it. So that's why awareness of the body is very important to feel, oh, I'm tensing. Oh, I'm tensing. I want to fight. Yeah. It makes me think about what you shared regarding animals and how afterwards they shake to like get it out. And that's why they're not holding on to it. And I think one of the things that you notice that you named that is true for me is that embarrassment might actually be the thing that is stopping me from self-regulation. Yeah. That doing the touching, doing the breathing, doing the, particularly if, if, number one, in front of someone else to calm myself. But even on my own, I may think this is silly. This is fine. There is nothing wrong. Calm down. Like trying to use my mind to regulate my body. And I think that's one of my takeaways is that if we are, if we are leaning on, or if we are concerned about being embarrassed, then that is going to prevent us from doing the things that we need to do, making the sounds, doing the touch, Mm -hmm. having the breath work that we need to do in order to be calm. So what I'm hearing is I need to separate myself (laughs) in the midst Mm -hmm. of conflict, take a few minutes to do all the weird looking and sounding things that need to happen for me to calm down in order for me then to come back and be more present in that conversation. Yeah. And some, sometimes when I'm in the middle of a meeting, for example, and I get triggered for some reason, I, it doesn't look uh, weird outside, but I scan my body to see, is there any molecule in my body, which is a somatic experiencing tool? Is there any molecule in my body that feels content and safe? And usually even in the middle of a crisis, for example, I have a two year old son and when he has a fewer and he's very sick, it's, it's really triggering. I want to like do something and I just can't. And at that moment, even in that moment, which is very triggering for me, I ask, I ask myself, is there any molecule in my body that feels safe? And I usually, I never had a time where I said no. Mm-hmm. Like I feel that my, for example, hands are calm. And then I bring all my awareness to my hands, feeling the calmness, even though I'm f- still having the anxiety and feeling the calmness in my hands, sensing it is like feeding the parasympathetic nervous system and helping the other parts of my body to, Oh, there's a still safe part in my body. That's good. And actually it's very, 
I stopped snapping out, so to say, after I started doing somatic work because I can be grounded in a safe place in my body. So whatever happens, I might get affected by it. But knowing that I can contain it or get some help, I think it's a very good thing to to help us uh, staying calm. Just hearing this information for me, um, one, it, it kind of affirms that I'm not crazy. Mm. And also affirms that I'm the work that I'm doing is exactly what I need for me, that I need to go in from the body because, you know, I've been going through the mind for for many, many years. And um, I feel like I've done that work. And I think a lot of that gets sort of stuck in my body. And when I was hearing you say, like, there's always a part of my body that feels safe, you know, that that also makes me think, oh, I need to like open my mind to the idea of like both of those things can happen at the same time. I could yeah. be soaking in anxiety. I could be, you know, I could feel like, you know, every fiber of my being is overwhelmed by fear. It, that doesn't mean to say that I can't find a molecule that might just feel safe. Like to have that open mind to be like both of those things can be true. I, you know, that a part of my body, my mind can be anxious, but somewhere in my body, I can find calmness. And that, that this like being allowing for that to happen. I think that was, that was like, I was reflecting on that. I was like, yeah. Mm-hmm. And the other piece is just appreciating the times where I've been in situations where I was allowed to, when I say allowed, that it was okay for me to like get up and start pacing or move or stretch while I'm trying to problem solve, while I'm trying to have a difficult conversation with somebody that, that it isn't, it doesn't have to happen on the couch. It doesn't have to happen on a chair. I think if you were having difficult conversations, like allowing mobility, allowing people to stretch, to move from one chair to another, maybe um, not even allowing, but like making yourself, like you don't have to sit and, and be in one place to have difficult conversations, but to move around, to be in your body, to feel your feet while you're doing that and having both of those things happen at the time, I think can also really help. I think the one thing that, that you said that resonates also is the distinction between what I think I've been trying to do, which is calm myself down mm-hmm. versus expanding the calm that already exists in my body. Those are two different. I think one was like, I'm focusing on the anxiety and trying to release or squish down the anxiety. The other is finding the calm and focusing on the calm and expanding that out. That's a great uncoupling. That's amazing. Yeah. Beautiful. So isn't it, isn't it beautiful to fit, to think that the calmness even is in yourself already just finding it that uh, instead of fighting, resisting to something and try to reach to something. I think that is a very good uh, differentiation. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And honor, honoring that your safety is within, you know, that's the other piece is like you're honoring your anxiety. You're like, yep. Rather than trying to suppressing it, changing it, you're like, you're honoring the feelings and then you're yeah. finding the calm and let it expand into and, and into like holding it all. So, yeah. yeah. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about your work with sound, because one of the things that I realized is that when I'm in an anxious space, I often can't stand the silence, which is probably what I need. And instead I go to TikTok, I go to a podcast, I go to something to hear something just to distract myself from the sound of what's happening in my mind. But essentially I'm going from big energy to another thing that's continuing (laughs) me to have big energy. And I'm wondering if you can talk about the power of sound and your work in particular around leveraging that to help us calm. Yeah. Very nice thing that you mentioned. My journey led me to sound because I couldn't stand silence and it led me to sound because I realized after years of therapy, I realized that I needed to do something daily basis to help myself. And that was meditation. But I tried many forms of meditation. I got meditation training and I found it the best thing to meditate with for me was sound. And then I wanted to learn why sound is very powerful for meditation. And then I went to the British Academy of Sound Therapy and there I learned the science of sound and meditation. And I realized that when I was anxious, my brain was probably was in the beta state uh, and it could be measured in, in hertz. So with EEG and the sound uh, healing uses the instruments that uh, imitates when your brain is in meditation, which is the alpha or theta. So they actually imitates that sound waves. And after eight or 12 minutes, 
it helps you to entrain to that uh, place of being meditated without a lot of effort. So I loved this, uh, the science behind it. And then I started to use it in my work. And then I started to work as a practitioner of sound therapy. And that led me to somatic experiencing because I realized without the words, without using the words, because I think even now as I talk, you are understanding it. Or when you're talking, I understand the words you're saying with my perception. So I can't really understand you. And um, I realized that the sound can reach to places that the my, my mind would not be able to reach. For example, a sound just resonated with a feeling that I was suppressing. And then I started crying, for example. And I was like, what is going on? It was very deep. And then it led me somatic to somatic experiencing because I realized when I was doing uh, sound therapy sessions, I realized people remembering stuff that they were not remembering or that they had visions about things that happened or they were trembling that like the deer uh, escaping from the uh, bear. And I actually talked it to uh, my mentor and she told me about somatic experiencing. And that is also reaching to the uh, intelligence of the nervous system. And the sound also takes us there because, and we talked about the early childhood and at those times we didn't know words. So I also find very interesting is the sounds, using the sounds, listening to sounds, uh, is also uh, a very good uh, vehicle to take us there. This is my experience. Yeah, actually, quick interlude there. I wanted to point out about sound and, and not having sound when you're younger. Something that I've recently been talking, thinking about a lot is I did most of my therapy in English, which is different than my mother tongue. And a lot of my developmental years um, happened in my mother tongue. So I've recently been thinking about whether the therapy that I've been doing in English has been reaching to the right mm. layers and whether whether there's something to be said about doing the therapy in your mother tongue or the, the language that you were using during the time that you're you're trying to deal with. So that's something that's actually been mm. on my mind. Mm. And from what I've heard from you, you can bypass all of that and do some sound therapy that can really extend beyond language and get to the get to the, the nervous system, get to the, the subconscious, to where those things live in in story and in pictures and not necessarily in language. Yeah. So that's actually been on my mind a lot. And hearing you say that is now kind of connecting the dots. Mm. And I'm interested in exploring options that are beyond language. And, yeah. and also maybe the reason why things like movement therapy have always worked for me. And when I, you know, when I came to your retreat, the, the, the sound healing, again, I feel like it was reaching to a place that I haven't been, a, that I wasn't able to get to. And the question is always is, is it a language issue? You know, mm -hmm. not a fluent, not a, not a language issue in terms of fluency, but yeah. language issue in terms of the experiences are in a different language. So it's almost like living yeah. those with subtitles, you know. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of been on my mind. And now when I'm hearing you say that, I'm like, huh, OK, maybe there's something to be something to work out there. Yeah. Do you think you can give us a taste of what it would be like to have kind of that grounding in the body through sort of a mini, mini meditation a mini sort of um, guided tour of, of our nervous system. Yeah. I mean, we can just, we can just explore it now to see mm -hmm. how, how we feel. Mm -hmm. I see that both of you are sitting. People who are listening to this should not try to do this while driving. I have to say that. Yes, no, absolutely. Yes we can just start to feel or bring our awareness to where we touch the ground. So if we were standing, it would be the soles of our feet. And since three of us sitting here, we can bring all our, our awareness to our hips and the sitting bones. And just trying to feel the relationship between the ground, the chair or wherever we're sitting and the muscles of our hips. So they are touching each other. Our hips are touching the surface we're sitting on. The place we're sitting on is touching the hips. 
and just realizing if we're bringing our awareness to this relationship, does anything shift or change in the hips, the muscles in the hips, pelvic muscles? And we can also imagine saying to the cells in our hips that, oh, there's nowhere to go now. We are where we should be. And you can relax. What happens in the body when we say that, when we think about that? In the hips. And maybe move our awareness to if we're Um, if we have anything that supports you in our back, feeling the support at the back of our body and feel that support and just being curious about what shifts in, a, in my body when I feel the support of the ground, of the place I'm sitting on, and the support in the back. What happens? And I just realized now in my arms, I feel like a wave of relaxing. I can feel my shoulders letting go a little bit. So just sensing it, feeling it. And maybe reminding myself There is no life-threatening thing going on in this moment. I might feel sad. I might feel anxious. I might feel joyful. But at this moment right now here, I'm not under a life-threatening situation. What happens in the body when I say that? What happens in the body when I say... At this moment, I'm safe. I just felt a expansion, a little bit of expansion in my chest. So you can track your own sensations. What is happening in the body? And maybe taking a couple of breaths, feeling the support from the back, feeling the support of the ground. And then if your eyes close, if your eyes were closed, you can slowly open them. And using your neck, you can orient around and see, see where you're at. See couple of details and really track with your eyes that this where I'm at is there anything that feels good maybe a color maybe a picture maybe a tree is there anything around that feels good so noticing them and noticing what happens in the body as I see three different things that feels or looks good Yeah. Yeah. So what shifts in the in the body? I think it was like three or four minutes. But did you um realize anything in your body or your breath? I have definitely felt my shoulders release where I keep pretty much all of my tension, like on the traps, like my traps are flexed from almost the moment that I wake up to, to the, when I go to bed. Unless I do this kind of work to, to really like work with my nervous system or work yeah. with the muscles. And when you prompted to check in to see what changes when I feel supported, um, yeah. I immediately felt my shoulders just drop. 
and my arms get heavy because they dropped in a, in, in, in a nice way, in a way that I'm like, oh, okay, I don't have to carry, I don't have to like tighten and carry everything. So that was definitely the thing that stood out for me. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely, I feel more calm now than I did before. And I also recognize when you were asking for us to put our attention to our hips and our back, that I'm not comfortable and that I often sit in positions that are not comfortable. And so what really actually made me aware was like the discomfort in my hips and my back that I yeah. force my, my body into positions for productivity that yeah. do not feel comfortable and have just, and then just numb the discomfort, become aware of it. And then of course at night I'm complaining that everything hurts and cannot understand yeah. why. <laughs> yeah, and so I think true. those are the two things. It's just being aware that I am yeah. uncomfortable and what do I need to do to shift that? And then overall just feeling more calm. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Amazing. Um, so insightful, Rida. Whenever I speak yeah. to you, I walk away. I'm like, oh, this is so exciting and so it's new. True. And um, and or at least like, even if it's the information that I know, that hearing you explain it and put it into certain context just gives me another angle. So I really appreciate yes. that. Always rich, just rich. The conversations I feel with you are always rich. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I love to be here. I, I feel very <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, we loved having you. We want to ask if you're comfortable four questions about a little bit more about you um, before we let you go. So the first question that we want to ask is, what is one piece of advice that you would give to your younger self about love, sex, or relationships? Oh, I would go to her and say, please work on yourself because the things the, the the burdens, the things that happens to you over and over are not only your, your baggage. So clear them out, enjoy and have fun. Mm, <laughs> nice. Good that. advice. Great advice. Yeah. Um, okay. What is one romantic or sexual adventure on your bucket list? I think it's being in, in public. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think it's having a sexual adventure in a public space, sort to say, like in a forest or, or mm -hmm. in a park. That would be a good oh. adventure. Yeah, yes. nice. And I like that it's both public and in nature. I like yeah. <laughs> I like that you're in a combination of the both. I like that a lot. Um, third question is, how do you challenge the status quo? I think by talking um, sexuality in Turkey. Mm. yes as a woman yes mm. yes it's like talking about sexuality talking about sexuality in turkey talking yeah. about sexuality in turkey as a woman yeah. i think you are challenging the status quo <laughs> thrice <laughs> for sure for sure okay um, Rida, i know how curious you are and i know the answer to that question is going to be many many things but what are, what are you curious about lately what's on your plate lately that you're pondering on well, actually, I'm very curious about um, somatic work and sexuality. And we've been mm -hmm. talking about, with, you, yes. with you about that. Uh -huh. And the first thing that came up to my mind is that how yeah. to feel safe in, a, in sexuality or mm -hmm. how to let our body have joy mm -hmm. using somatic tools. That is, mm -hmm. that is making me very curious. Yeah, so desire yeah. and pleasure and allowing yeah. ourselves to feel that way, particularly if we have felt unsafe. Yeah. 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 Right, right. And balancing the arousal and safety, right? Because you need mm -hmm. both. If it's too safe, you don't really get aroused. And if you're too yeah. aroused, you can tip yourself into mm -hmm. how do you balance those things and exactly. find find joy and excitement without triggering yourself. So yeah. we're gonna talk more about that, Rita. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited. Thank, Thank you so you much. So, so yeah, much. I really appreciate it. You're you. very welcome. So nice to be here. Thank you. Lots of food for thought in that interview. Mm -hmm. For me, the things that stood out the most and that I want to make sure that I apply in my self regulation toolbox mm -hmm. is first, recognizing the impact of back to back to back to back meetings <laughs> and the, the frenetic energy and what I thought was excitement, but really probably is anxiety mm -hmm. that is produced from that. Yeah. And so the distinction between excitement and, and anxiety and regulating that stimulation with calmness mm -hmm. instead of distraction. I think mm -hmm. up until this point, right afterwards, when I'm feeling that buzz, I go to a mm -hmm. podcast, I go to TikTok, mm -hmm. I go to Instagram, I go to something. And now I realize I need to be <laughs> calm. <laughs> I need to focus on 
and calm. And so, so that's one piece I think, but also that bringing awareness to the part of my body that feels mm-hmm. safe and calm mm-hmm. instead of trying to force my body to feel calm, mm-hmm. that idea of expanding out the calm in my body mm-hmm. really stuck with me. And then I think the last piece is just allowing myself to move mm-hmm. and to cry and to feel and to anything else yeah. that is required to get the anxiety or the fear unstuck from my body. Sure. Yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, those are definitely the pieces that stuck out for me um, and they resonate and they're part of the, you know, the work that, that I'm continued to. And, and when I hear it back to me, I'm just like, I feel affirmed that I'm on the right path. <laughs> yeah. The, in addition to those couple of things that I thought was super interesting, uh, what she, what she was saying about um, the city Mm. And how the excitement of the city resonated with her. And it was like, it, she, mm-hmm. she registered it initially as, as excitement, mm-hmm. but it was actually the, the chaos of the city was more resonating with her, with her anxiety. Mm-hmm. And I, that definitely something that I experienced with New York. When mm-hmm. I first moved to the city, I thought I found home. I found this was the place that was like for me. And I couldn't explain why yeah. my parents were like, you've traveled the world, you know, you've been around multiple times, lived on these cities, like why New York? Why mm-hmm. New York? And I couldn't really put words to it. And on reflection, I think it's just because the chaos that my body used to yeah. just like felt familiar. New York City is <laughs> chaos felt familiar. I was yeah. like, oh yeah, this is about the right, the right <laughs> resonance. The speed and tempo. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> like that's pretty much how my nervous system is. <laughs> and and since then I've actually heard other people say that. I've been yeah. people say that there's a disproportionate amount of people in New York City with trauma it's because mm. their nervous system just like resonates Interesting. with the chaos of, of, of New York. And, and they almost have this like codependent relationship with the city because yeah. they feel like this is the only place their, their nervous system really kind of feels aligned. Mm-hmm. And I think, does that serve them did it serve me like the questions that you know yeah the questions up that but I thought that was really interesting I have yeah. definitely come to that conclusion myself yeah 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 because yeah. yeah, you've had now spaciousness to be in a space yes. of quiet and right. I'm like what is that like what must that be yeah, like <laughs> yeah I mean just nature you know just uh just being in nature instead of yeah. the city's chaos instead of being in an environment that my nervous system feels familiar with, knowing that my nervous system is not wise mm. or hasn't been wise, instead of going, oh, this feels like home. This is where my, my mm. nervous system just gets to be in, its, in, in, that, in that resonance. Mm-hmm. Being in nature and thinking, how can I get my nervous system to match this? Yeah. Rather than find an environment that matches my nervous system. Interesting, yeah. I think has been definitely a part of my healing. Yeah. And um, yeah. yeah, like hanging around in nature, like weeding, (laughs) planting things and, and, and trying to get my nervous system to be aligned with that. It's been a huge, huge part of uh, my healing for sure. Mm. The other thought, the other thing that was interesting for me, again, just like connecting some dots, you know, she talked about this idea of arousal, um, whether that's through fear or whether that's through, you know, sexual arousal, but just arousal of the body, which I think on a biochemical level just looks the same, mm, right? Mm-hmm. The story is what fleshes it out, right? Mm-hmm. And then in an ideal world, you sort of go up into, you know, you, you get aroused for whatever reason. And then there is a release and a come down and then you complete the circle and yes. then you have closure and, and you then process it and then put, it, you know, archive it somewhere in your mind. Mm-hmm. Um, I think a version of that, that, that I see is, um, how it plays out in kink. You know, there's a, there's a whole school of thought that truly believes that kink, like a conscious mindful kink that's safe, sane and consensual, mm-hmm. um, can be super healing to people with trauma, especially sexual trauma. Mm-hmm. And they find ways to process their trauma, mm-hmm. um, in sort of kink scenes. And I think it's because it mimics this idea of arousal mm-hmm. through, impact play or whatever the, whatever the situation, whatever the thing that in the, in the scene that's getting them aroused. And then there's a come down and, um, aftercare, mm. which, which allows the nervous system to return back to, um, you know, back to its the baseline. And yeah. I think that is why kink can be therapeutic. I think it closes the loop mm. that, you know, that, that Redada is through somatic experiencing, right. Mm-hmm. And it's also, I think, important to realize, like, you need to find your own medicine. Mm-hmm. You really need to like, educate yourself, be open-minded, try a few things to find the thing that's going to help you heal and explore and understand yourself. Yes. I think what Rida does through um, somatic experiencing, I think some people find that through kink. 
that yeah. that like getting back you getting you back up to that aroused state that hyper aroused state and then coming back down and telling your nervous system every up has a down and mm-hmm. there's going to be a loop that's going to be completed so that when it comes up down the line you're like oh i know my way back down from here i know my way back down to like completing the circle yeah so those are the things that just like got me thinking yeah yeah that makes sense to me i've been thinking personally a lot about things like the ritual after uncoupling and and a a sense of closure that Mm -hmm. you can do either with the other person or just with yourself or at the end of the day particularly now for many of us who work and and play and eat and live in the same space that that distinguishing of that space is now is really challenging and so taking a second to have a ritual at the end of the day yeah. to say, I am now done with work. Right. I'm going to let, I'm going to let that all yeah. the zoom meetings, I'm going to process right. that. I'm going to breathe through it. And then I'm going to transition my energy and my mind into being present in the house. So that sounds like the same kind of thing yes. that we need to replicate and emulate the the scene and the closure right. and the aftercare in other areas of our life. Right. Right. Absolutely. And, and also the other thing that she, you know, she said is taking your time. And I think yeah. um, those of us that live in the cities, especially cities, like uh, New York she lives in Istanbul which mm-hmm. is also if you don't know it's a it's, a high, it's one of those mega cities like yeah. New York that doesn't sleep that's like you know super high energy Th- that pace isn't that necessarily good for us yes. right in order for us to close these loops get our body to really register what's going on be in its own process we need to slow down and if our environment are inherently fast like city life we need to make a point of slowing down we need to pay away of taking that second that you mentioned yeah maybe it's you know, not a second, but a few minutes, maybe yeah. half an hour. Yeah. And allowing, allowing us that space mm-hmm. and time to, to process this stuff, which we don't. Yeah. If you are interested in taking some time to calm, if you are interested in learning more about how to calm your nervous system and find inner safety within the chaos, then we invite you to explore Reda's work. You can find more from Reda at her website at soundalatherapy.com, S-O-U-N-D-A-L-A therapy.com or on Instagram at Sandala Therapy, where you can listen to her work via the universal language of music and find her sound bath for meditation on Spotify through her name or through Sandala Therapy. We'll put the links in our show notes. And Effie and I can be found on Instagram, Facebook, and Curious Fox website, all under the name We Are Curious Foxes. We're working to increase our reach and we need your help. So please share this podcast or this episode with a friend, quickly rate the show, leave a comment or subscribe on Apple and follow on Stitcher and Spotify. If you want to continue to support the show and indulge your curiosity, then join us on Patreon at We Are Curious Foxes, where you can find behind the scenes footage, mini episodes, and over 50 videos of educator-led workshops. Go to Patreon, We Are Curious Foxes. And lastly, let us know that you are listening by sharing a comment, story, or question. You can email us or send us a voice memo at listening at wearecuriousfoxes.com, or you can record a question for the show by calling us at 201 870-0063. This episode is produced and edited by Nina Pollock, whose talent and expertise brings Jackie and I an incredible sense of calm. Our intro music is composed by Dev Saha. We are so grateful for their work and we're grateful to you for listening. As always, stay curious, friends. Curious Fox podcast is not and will never be the final word on any topic. We solely aim to encourage curiosity and provide a space for exploration through connection and story. We encourage you to listen with an open and curious mind and we'll look forward to your feedback. Stay curious, friends. Stay curious. Stay curious. Stay curious. Stay curious. Stay curious. Stay curious. curious. Stay curious.